said? Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Micah, chapters 2, 5, and 7. Micah, chapters 2, 5, and 7. We'll start in 7, dabble in a couple places, end up in 7 again. I want to begin by letting you know that I take (laughs) great solace. I take personal comfort in the fact that some of the faithful giants of the Christian faith got depressed and felt defeated. It was the late 1560s, during a time when many, many people died for holding to certain Christian beliefs. Queen Mary, she was Scottish, Roman Catholic, Mary Queen of Scots, she seemed to be coming back into power, and so the, the, the Scottish Protestant reformer John Knox had, had just led a really incredible reformation and revival in the land, and, and so she was coming back into power toward the end of his life, and he felt, he felt the need, along with some who told him, hey, it'd be wise for you to leave. He felt the need to temporarily leave the city and to find safety in the country, and so Toward the end of his life, some of the established religious powers were kind of fighting against John Knox and his reformation and his movement, and things were beginning to get kind of ugly. And so when he feared for the spiritual state of his countrymen, he wrote this, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit and put an end at thy good pleasure to this my miserable life for justice and truth are not to be found among the children of men. By the way, Merry Christmas. thought I'd start heavy today <laughs> with some jokes. Charles Spurgeon is considered one of the most gifted and most prolific preachers of all time. And he was known to go through major bouts of defeat and discouragement. There would be times he'd be gone for weeks on end. At least mine's only a few hours. I take great solace and comfort in knowing that many of the great faithful servants of Jesus went through difficulty and pain and depression and discouragement and defeat. I'm ashamed to say that about 15 years ago when I, when I still felt like I had boundless ambition and ego and uh, energy, and before I knew that I was old enough, uh, before I was old enough to know that life was actually hard and I wasn't as awesome as I thought, You'd laugh. I remember hearing about a pastor I knew uh, who admitted to going through major bouts of discouragement. And I'm ashamed to say at the time, I remember thinking to myself, weak sauce. I would never tell an entire congregation that. And here we are. I don't know if you feel like that quote from John Knox But there are many times in my life, just this week a few times, where I thought, Lord, just take me home now. Really. There's too much to do. It's just too hard. The world is too ugly. It's too broken. I'm too sinful. And it's just too hard everywhere around me to be be alive for the rest of it. I I don't want to be around to keep fighting in a world where it feels like thorns and thistles everywhere. If you don't know what I mean by thorns and thistles, you need to read Genesis 3. I don't know if you ever feel like that, but I know I do a lot. And I know that for me, even during a season like this, like Christmas, 
that's supposed to be about the joy and the wonder of God coming to be with us in the flesh to save us from sin. It's easy for me to despair like John Knox. In all of about 30 seconds of doom scrolling through a couple news sources or something online, in just about 30 seconds of doom scrolling, I can easily go from the joy and wonder of Christmas and the excitement of being with my family and the excitement of seeing my kids open presents (laughs) to being in the kind of, of, of despair that feels like The only solution is another cookie or four. The truth is, I'm so tossed to and fro by the circumstances around me in my life that in a normal day I can vacillate between tearful joy and seething anger and frustration easily a hundred times. I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm such a mess of what feels like, on the one hand, crippling personal anxiety, one minute, and an idealistic love and passion for the truth of God the next minute, that I, that I foolishly and sometimes unwisely think, to myself far too often, just like John Knox, Lord Jesus, I'm begging you, I'm begging you, please, receive my spirit and put an end at thy good pleasure to this, my miserable life. And even if all y'all judgy people out there aren't like me and are so much better, and you're not an internal emotional spaz like me, some of the staff and people who know me are like external emotional spaz as well, Even if you're not an internal emotional spaz like me, if you're at least half aware of reality and you're an adult, then at least at some meaningful level, you're at least feeling these problems and struggling to fix them. And you're at least occasionally wondering, Lord, how is any of this going to work? How is this situation going to be better? How is my marriage, my family, my kids, my job, how are these things going to improve, get better, be fixed? Those of y'all who still have enough youth and ego and energy to think you're awesome enough for it all, there will be a time where you'll think there's too much brokenness, too much pain, too much cancer, too many bills, too much laundry, too many mouths to feed, too many people to help, too little time. And maybe you feel, Lord, I'm doing my best, and the more I say yes to living in ways that I think you've called me to, the more I say yes to integrity, the more I say yes to the responsibility of caring for others around me, the more I feel like I feel just more and more behind. Visitors are like, he's your pastor? (laughs) Stick around, we fix self-righteousness, don't you worry. And then to top it all off, since you don't have enough stress since COVID made abundantly clear that apparently everything has to be political. We're closing in on a presidential election next year. I'm already stressed, frankly. When I think about that, I just think, Lord Jesus, please, take me. I say all that because it's hard to avoid, it's hard to avoid the despair and the frustration when it, when it looks and feels all around us like evil is winning. And then for the Christian who wants to, who wants to do what God says and to, to follow Jesus and to become more like him. It's not just out there, it's, it's in here. It's in our own lives. This is, this is pretty much akin to what the prophet Micah describes in Micah 7 at the beginning of this chapter. When he looks around the world and his own life and he laments about the state of the world, he says this, follow along. 
Micah 7, verse 1. Woe is me, for I have become like Scott. I mean, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. Micah says, it's like I've been picked over and there's nothing left in the tank. It's just bare. It's a description of feeling like I'm dying here. He says, there is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished from among the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. The word upright here in this verse 2, it's a form of a Hebrew word that's used in Micah 6, 8. It's the word chesed. It's a form of that word. You've got to have the when you say that, by the way. Chesed is a word that shows up a bunch in the Old Testament that describes the steadfast loving kindness. The kind of everlasting love that's set on God's people because it's a covenant to love that depends on his character and nature and not theirs. Chesed is trustworthy love because it comes from the character and nature of God. And so in verse 2, he says, there is no one chesed-like among mankind. He contrasts it with Micah 8, I'm sorry, Micah 6, 8, where he says, and some of you probably know this verse, Micah 6, 8 is where it says, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness, that's the word chesed, and to walk humbly with your God. And so the prophet Micah, the, the prophet Micah, the prophet Micah, the prophet Micah says there's no covenant man around. There's no, none of them are left. He says they all lie in wait for blood. Each hunts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The text here is being ironic and sarcastic, like, well, they are good at one thing, being evil. In fact, it's the leaders, the prince and the judge, they ask for a bribe. That's how it works in the world. And even the great man, meaning like the greatest of them you could find, the great man, verse 3, utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus, they all weave it together. They're in cahoots with each other for themselves. And they're good at it. Don't get close to them, he says. Verse 4, the best of them is like a briar. The most upright of them, a thorn hedge. Get too close and they'll cut you. You'll be a part of all that. It'll affect you. It gets worse. Of course it does. Because it's not just out there. (laughs) It's easy for us to go, oh, the world Oh, it's so. I wish they. It's not just out there. It's within our own ranks. It's within our own hearts. Verse 4. The day of your watchman, of your punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. So put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Even in one's own household and family, he says, guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt, The daughter rises up against her mother, and just in case we haven't made clear that it affects everyone and every relationship, even within, Micah throws in an obscure one to make the point, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. In In summary, he says, a man's enemies are the men of his own house. Yes? Yes? We start this sermon on a rough note. Because there's no point in pretending that sin isn't real, that we don't struggle against it, that some of us have our hands on it well. And and there's no point in pretending that the world that we live in is militating against you 
living a godly life that is a witness to Jesus. Verse 7 is where Micah begins to make the turn. (laughs) Begins to make the turn, and so will we then, to the Christmas hope that's offered in the Messiah. He says this, verse 7, But as for me, in contrast to all that stuff, as for me, if I have to be the only one, he says, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Now at the beginning of verse 7 here, something a little bit interesting. And this is something that the Hebrew language does a lot. It emphasizes by repeating words. (laughs) Usually, often one right after another, the same exact word. And there's nothing special about that other than to say, the emphasis here is, I, I. (laughs) But I, I. In contrast to what was just described about those who lie in wait for blood, Micah says, but I, let them all do whatever. Let them claim whatever. Let them militate against the people of God, trying to live in accordance with the image of God in them, to be a witness for the sake of this baby we've come to worship. Let them all militate against it. The one who waits for the Lord is the one that says, let them all, but I, I, I'm going to look to the Lord. I'm going to wait for him to answer. Because I know he's the only hope I have. And here's the hope we're waiting for. Micah 2, jump back. As we recount what we've studied a bit the last couple weeks, Micah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 5, at the end of both of the previous weeks, we highlighted these verses. Micah 2, 12 to 13 says this, God speaking, I will surely, certainly, just like the Hesed love is dependent upon his character and nature. He says, this will happen because I will make it happen. I will certainly assemble. I will gather all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel, meaning those who are left over and saved through the, dove, the, the judgment, the evil, the hard parts of what we've been talking about and what they've been experiencing. And then here's some explicitly shepherd part of the text here. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture. And then here's the king part. He's putting together these concepts, these ideas and pictures of shepherd and king to describe in Micah what he's doing for his people. The king part, verse 13, he who opens the breach goes up before them. A king who leads the army into battle is what this king is like. They break through, meaning those who are following this king, they break through and they pass the gate going out by it. The king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. So Micah, written 700 years before Jesus, says, let me tell you what it's like when you're waiting on this shepherd king. And he hints at it here, in chapter 2. And then in Micah 5, the hint grows. And notice in Micah 5, verses 1 through 5, notice that this shepherd king idea, it grows a bit to become a more personal, more personal and permanent deliverer. Look at verse 1. Now, muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. It's not just that things seem bad. They are beginning to be actually bad in their time. With a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. One of the two parts of the kingdom had already begun to lose their land. The the king had been captured, and soon they would lose the temple. And the prosperity that they'd known was about to be wiped away. But then notice again, just like we talked about in Micah 7, verse 
7, but I. Out of nowhere, Micah says, verse 2, there is hope in God's promises. It says, but you, but you, which reaching back to Micah 4, 8, we know is a signal of God beginning to intervene in time and history for his people to restore the king, to restore the king that would lead the people. He says, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to even be among the clans of Judah. There would be lists, in fact, where they'd be kind of forgotten. Oh, oh yeah, that place. Just like, just like David was the last of the brothers to be chosen, from the most unlikely circumstances, from that place where, oh, oh yeah, that place, from you, God says, shall come forth, notice, for me, meaning for my purposes, God says, one who is to be the ruler in Israel, who will restore my people's fortune. And then notice, one who's coming forth is from old, from ancient days. This is another example of Hebrew emphasizing again, it's not just old, it's old, old. It's like saying, this was God's plan all along. So verse 3, therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. We all know who that is. This prophecy 700 years before the coming of Christ was being shown to be specific. There's a she who is in labor who has given birth. After that, then, verse 3, the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. More symbolism of, of the return of the people and the gathering of God's people so that he could restore their fortunes through a king, through a shepherd. It says, verse 4, and this one who was born, he shall stand and shepherd his flock. Notice, his flock. He will do that in the strength of the Lord, meaning in his own strength. It's even stated twice, in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. So this is his flock, it's in his strength, and it's in his name. And they will dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. So this flock, this gathering of his people, shall dwell secure in his strength and in his name. And then verse 5, he, he shall be their peace. This one who's born of a woman predicted 700 years before the time of Jesus, who would be like a shepherd and a king, who would be like the David who was the king over the people of God, but even more so and greater he himself will be their peace. And like we said last week, this isn't, this isn't peace that is the absence of conflict. This is peace that comes after a battle that's fought. This is a shepherd king who goes before, opens up the breach. Those who follow find safety and security and peace in the battle he fights for them. And so the shepherd king <laughs> is more specific in its form in Micah 5. He will stand in his own power and for his name. And he will have his flock. And this he will be born of an actual woman. And now jump back to Micah 7 at the very end of this chapter, where verses 18 through 20 are a kind of crescendo of the entire book. They're the last verses of the book, and they tell us in the most clear terms, the most explicit terms of this promised shepherd king and how it's not just an idea. <laughs> it's, it's something that actually happens for the people of God. He was being sent to deliver his people from sin. Look at verse 18. Micah says, in light of everything in the book that's predicting the coming of this 
shepherd king, he says, who, who is a God like you? Who is a God like you pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? Now look, this isn't just mere theoretical mumbo-jumbo. This isn't just like a theoretical overlooking of sin, as if to say that God pretends it didn't happen. This is the passing over of sin, like in Exodus, when the blood of the sacrificed lamb that was painted on the lintels of the houses, that sacrificed lamb's blood meant the payment had been made so that those who were in that house were passed over, and God's wrath against sin did not visit that house. This isn't theoretical. Hopefully, maybe, this shepherd king has the ideas right. This is the shepherd king is the payment by pardoning the iniquity and passing over the transgression. So this is a God who pardons by actually doing something effective for his people's sin. That's what verse 18 starts with. In light of the truth that this God is a shepherd king that goes before the people in his own strength so that he will stand for them, Micah says, who is a God like that? Who is a God like you? Is there one? Anyone? Anywhere? Where is another God who pardons and passes over sin? There isn't, there isn't one. More specifically, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He delights in chesed, the kind of love that comes from his character and nature as a perfect, eternal, infinite, holy God whose love can be depended upon and trusted because he sets it on those whose iniquities he pardons and whose sins he tramples underfoot. In fact, he loves to do that. He delights. He delights in extending his never-ending, trustworthy love. His never-ending, set on them, despite them, love. The kind of love that depends not on their holiness, but his mercy and his grace. Verse 19 says, he will again have compassion. And his compassion will take the form of a forgiveness that is described in two ways. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. I love this picture. He will stomp them out with his feet. Not because he's got big feet. I don't think Jesus probably had big feet. And conceptually, I think maybe, you know, metaphorically, God has gargantuan feet. But it's because... <laughs> Because he is able, as perfect, holy, infinite, eternal God, who is just and whose will carried out from his character and nature is always true. His feet can tread out our iniquities because he has just feet. And then notice... There's a, a turn in the middle of verse 19. He turns to you. Like a declaration about God, he will tread out our iniquities, becomes praise to God. So he will stomp out our sins with his righteous feet. And then, secondly, it says, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. I'm not sure which one of these two I like most, I like the first one because I think, <laughs> Jesus tramples out my sin? That's awesome. 
And then I think, wait, he casts my sins way down deep where I can't see and where all those crazy and scary creatures with huge fangs, with 20 arms, can eat my sins to oblivion and crush them to smithereens. Like the anglerfish. I don't know if you're aware of what that crazy thing looks like. But I, th- I think God takes my iniquities. And in Jesus, who is perfect righteous life for me before a holy God, not only does he stamp them out, he puts them in those places where I, will, I promise you I will never go, even if I'm in the, a submarine that I am guaranteed will never, nothing, I, not happening. I don't want to go there. I don't want to see him. You will cast, not, not some, not the ones that you think you most need forgiveness for, not the ones where you're like, uh, everybody else says this about me. I guess I should work on that. All our sins into the depths of the sea. And then finally, verse 20. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love. That's the word steadfast love. That's the chesed word again. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Verse 20 is making the point that this promise that is being made to us is the same promise that was made to all God's people all along. The promise that he will do it. Even to Jacob and Abraham and you and me. And friends, we're gathered today because Christmas. Christmas is the clear evidence of him having done so. And friends, I know that this may seem a little bit like an insane, a crazy, and perhaps even unlikely story to believe actually happened in the flesh, in the person of Jesus, in a baby. I know that it may seem like a bit of a crazy and perhaps even unlikely story to believe actually happened, let alone stake one's life on. But I want to end with this thought and flesh it out a bit. If Jesus was God in the flesh and he has trampled your sins underfoot and cast them to the unseen depths of the sea, then the only way to have an actually Merry Christmas is to know that your life is a gift of faithful worship to him. What I mean is this. (laughs) Stop trying to make a Merry Christmas happen as if you can. That is to fundamentally misunderstand what we're here to celebrate. The only way to have an actually Merry Christmas is to realize that the miracle of God making himself known in the flesh is the only hope you have against your sin. And it's the only hope you have of understanding the true and lasting joy of what we're here to celebrate in Christmas. And here's why I say it this way. Because if you're anything like me, and most everybody I know, it seems like every year the extra time and energy and money of making Christmas happen gets increasingly in the way of me seeing and treasuring the joy and wonder of what God has done for us in Christ. And I'm not saying there's something wrong with creating a a beautiful environment or cooking good food, making good memories, spending time with your family, buying the perfect Christmas present, bringing me more cookies. There's nothing wrong with all those wonderful things. Those are all good. But fundamentally, they are side dishes at best and shouldn't be even on the plate if they're functioning as replacements for knowing you have forever relationship with God through Jesus because of Christmas. There is no actually merry Christmas 
without a relationship with Jesus. There's the fakery of it. There's the making it happen. There's the pretense of joy. And so I'm here, friends, eventually and hopefully very soon here, to simply encourage you to not let Christmas happen while missing what God has done in Christ for us because that's the only possible thing that actually makes it merry. And I want to give you some encouraging proof (laughs) that in Christ God has trampled our sins underfoot and pardoned our iniquities and cast them to the depths of the sea where Leviathan and scary anglerfish live. Here's the proof. (laughs) All around you are people. All around you are people who actually live in the freedom of selfless sacrifice and worship because they have staked their very lives on the claim that this good news is real. At first, for some of you, that may not think like a, that may not seem like a a good proof to make, (laughs) but hear me out. And by the way, this doesn't mean that these people around you who are actually living in the, the freedom of a selfless sacrifice and worship because they've staked their lives on the truth of the gospel. This doesn't mean they're not sinners. This doesn't mean they don't struggle in life just like non-Christians. It just means that they know that there is a shepherd king who has preserved his people in his strength, brought them pardon and peace, and offered them by faith and trust in him. Him fighting against their sin and evil for them. And again, I know this sounds like perhaps the worst argument to make for the reality of sin being trampled underfoot by Christ, but the proof is the witness of saved sinners whose lives are an ongoing gift of faithful sacrifice and worship. Here's what I mean. I started out this morning by mentioning that after almost 21 years of being at First Christian Church, uh, and this is true, I love this church more today than ever. And uh, I said that I love days like this because there's a crowd of voices that come together and uh, the critical mass reminds me that we're a part of something much, much greater than any one of us and, and makes me think of heaven I love, I love days like this. I love all of it. But I want you to know that for me, much more than the fun and the excitement of today and much more of the reason why I love this church and I consider myself blessed by God to be a part of it is because I see in this church evidence of God having come in the flesh to save because, because next week, And then the week after that, and the week after that, and the week after that, and the week after that. When today is becoming a distant memory, and each campus has a third of the size of today, and the holiday glow has dimmed, the cameras are off, no one will be watching, you are surrounded by people who know that even when their acts of service and not counted. And it's not seen. In all of those moments when it's going to require unseen and uncounted sacrifice in a bunch of small ways that will never be noticed in order to make the big things happen. <laughs> in those moments, it's going to be the everyday, boring, faithful servants of this church who are the engine of the work that God blesses to communicate his goodness and glory and advance his kingdom. Friends, the witness of the people of God faithfully sacrificing their lives when nobody sees and nobody else cares 
and there aren't pom-poms following you around saying, good job. The lives of people like that who are submitted to the king, who alone counts their unseen faithfulness as an acceptable sacrifice that brings him glory. Those, those who just want to hear the king say, well done, when nobody else sees or cares or notices. That's the proof of a God who came in the person of Jesus in the flesh to make himself known so that they could have relationship through his sacrifice for them. Friends, I love this church because it's made up of people whose commitment is not about the size of this crowd, but it's about the worship of the Savior. I love this church because after almost 21 years, more than ever, the people who faithfully serve are an encouragement to me to continue to keep going when it's hard, to fight when I'm tired, to continue to maintain a singular focus on living to the glory of a God who gave his son when we were all hopeless and lost friends. The proof of Jesus is the faithfulness of the witness of his people whose lives day by day are staked on the truth. That without this baby growing up by the power of the Holy Spirit to live a perfect, sinless life for them, they are without hope. And they believe in that hope because they stake their service as a gift of worship back to God on it. What inspires God's people to show up week after week after week is not that we have figured out some big secret to doing church well or because any one of us has mastered the Christian life or is especially holy or is better than anyone else. But friends, the only real reason any one of us serves Christ with our lives is that we know that we have had our sins trampled underfoot for us. There is no other motivation for your service that will last when it's hard. It's knowing that we've had our sins trampled underfoot by a perfect and loving Savior who God the Father has sent to save us. Now again, if Jesus was God in the flesh and he has trampled your sins underfoot and he has cast them to the unseen depths of the sea, then the only way that you can have an actually merry Christmas is to know that your life is a gift of faithful worship to him. So friends, do you know that your life is lived back to him as a gift of faithful worship, that the king counts as worship through his perfect son. If you know that, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And if you don't, we want to invite you to trust in the baby God sent to be your shepherd and your king, who is your peace and who enables your pardon. Father in heaven, we're gathered today because we know that without you we are without hope. We know that if you do not live for us the perfect sinless righteous life that tramples justly our sins underfoot, we have nothing else. And so we place our faith and our trust entirely in you asking that you would give to us the mercy and grace that you offer. And that our faith and trust in this plan of yours from eternity past to bring to us a baby in the flesh, to trust that your plan is good and right and is the only hope we have. Father, give us 
a merry Christmas that knows that we don't have to make it up. We just have to rejoice in it. For the sake of your goodness and glory and our joy and delight in you, we pray. Amen.